right. Well, I think we'll get started. So welcome, everyone. I'm Kristen Fernandez. I'm the uh, event specialist within Circle. Um, welcome to Ask Chris Anything. We are so excited for you to join today. And thank you so much, Chris, again, for joining us. So we'll yep. start with the first question. Ready? So where do you see the restoration industry in five years, given the increase in mergers and acquisitions? That's actually it. So, so that's actually interesting. Five years. So if you can base it off the last five years where m and has really taken off, uh, the three things I think we saw from that that has been an improvement to the industry is that you've got private equity who plays really hard. So I worked for a private equity company back in 09. Um, they play really hard on the profit and loss. There's no fooling around there's no goodwill or good feeling there. It's it's a very numbers driven business. That means that when you're dealing with an insurance company that is is trying to resist the restorers making money, they're playing it where they're legalizing the process, and so they're really pushing the contract hard. Um, the businesses are structured better. Uh, they're larger businesses. From that side, it makes the restoration industry more sophisticated. What you lose is you lose some of that personal touch where you have a business that's been in business for 30 years. You know their cycles in restoration and, and you're there to help and respond. The people still do, but it's just a different culture within a company. Uh, in the next five years, depends what the economy does. And uh, But I don't think that that is going to change. I think if you run a really tight uh, independent business, you're going to absolutely drive the uh, the revenues up um, you're going to be able to grow within that network and then you're going to be able to sell, which is going to be easier to sell if you're running a really good business. That's, that's probably the big, biggest five years. Is there, is there a five-year negative? They're not big fans of low margin. So that, so that might make the pressures that are coming down from, from TPAs and other administrators and consultants that might make it harder on their business. Um, so it's interesting. It, that's a hard question, but yeah, I, I would say it's good. And, and it's probably really good for the independent operators that want to build to five and 10 million or 10 to 20 million. Uh, you'll get really good values out of your sale. Wonderful. Yeah. We have to start with the hard ones, right? I, they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> don't know what's um, coming you're... down the pipe. I was nervous this morning. I'm like, I don't know what they're going to ask. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that, that's a deep um, question. What about this one? So what are the best practices for running a restoration business smoothly? So there, there's a few things I saw at Encircle that I, yeah, let me think. There's a few things I saw in Encircle that would change my opinion of the industry. Uh, I thought 80 to 90% of restorers were, were, had sharpened all their skills and were like, you know, we're just hearing the flutter of the, the last 10%. That's what all the insurance companies uh, are struggling with. If you want to run a really good restoration company, you have to focus on understanding how to estimate jobs. You have to understand the technicals. There's so much to learn here. This is the hardest trade. And yet it's the least organized when it comes to putting a business together. If you're looking at a plumbing business, it's an organized path to get there. This is so complex, so hard that to run it, you need one really good people. And we're having such a hard time paying for those caliber of people that you're trying to compete with in the plumbing and HVAC industry. Uh, you need really good attention to being able to pick up the technical skills because every technical skill you learn usually turns into either reducing liability or increasing profitability within your business. And that takes time and experience. And so the biggest thing I would say is focus on your, your skill set, your people, the culture you build. Everyone says it, but, it, but I think it matters here because you, you're in a business where people care. Uh, mental health is another one that's, that's really emerging where you're seeing lots of trauma. We don't think about it in, in a mental health way, but it wears you down if you see people lose their stuff every day. Uh, there has to be a, a sort of a, just a handling and coping with that emotional feelings that you see of customers. And then the last thing I'd say is as an owner, you have to make better business decisions. We took every job that came through the door. Some of those ended up in, in not lawsuits, but they, they ended up in where we lost money due to legal process or we screwed the job up. 
you have to select the work that's coming in the door. Not every job is a job you want, even if it's an emergency. So that's how I would run it. If I were to, to be back in the uh, saddle tomorrow, I, I would be very selective of the work I took. So then speaking about profitability, do you have any advice, tips, or tricks to keeping your overhead low and your net profit high? So overhead in two ways. So I look at overheads as things like shops and there's certain things that you just, you're going to spend good money on. Uh, people spend good money on like not trying to keep the overhead low. We've seen companies that run low, you know, low skill technicians, low skill pay uh, to match it and try to make their margin there. I don't think that's where you make your margin. We're an equipment driven business the way we're set up now. We're a response business. So people cheap out on their vehicles all the time or they just grab like a people mover and they can't haul equipment around with it. Your business is about deploying assets into the field. And so you got to change your mindset and look at that. Um, how do you get your margins up? Sometimes it's, it's changing your price. Uh, sometimes it's changing your pricing method. So like don't use unit pricing when you don't know how a job is going to uh, uh, play out. If you can't figure out the efficiencies, probably not a good time to use unit pricing where you're locked into an efficiency and a price probably move over to like rate and material or some other system maybe even bidding uh, but it's it's just looking at the game more strategically than most people have and it's because we're reactive you just unless you make a conscious effort to look at your business for hey how do i increase my profits here what do i if i make these three changes what's it going to do my top line if i make these three changes what does it do with my bottom line and then how does it impact capability and, uh, and, and our service? All of that. But yeah, the, to shorten up the answer, it would be to make sure that I didn't cut in the worst place to cut, which is people. Invest in them, but you have to find the right people. And, and to that point, I stopped doing ads where we were like, oh, this is a great business. We were like, this is a tough business. You're going to be sweaty. You're going to be feeling sore at the end of the day. And we got a totally different employee when we said, hey, we're not the easy business. We're not trying to lure you in. We're looking for hardcore people. It's just maybe building that culture of like, we're doing hard things and we're helping the community. If you're on for that path, if you get those people into your business, some of the other stuff just drops into place, but you have to teach everyone how to be profitable. So then what about some hints or help on how to deal with adjusters to expedite bill payment and reduce bill reductions? Yeah. So, so there's, there's a couple of things like adjusters and the insurance world pay slow. And in any other business, if you said it was a 90 day cycle, that would be factored into your price. So you'd be, you'd be sitting there going, when I deal with this insurance company, they, they pay a 90, the price for them is higher. Like as if you were paying for, for anything else in any other service, if we pay quick, the, the price should come down a little bit to reflect the, the quick pay that discount that you're giving or the quick pay that you're receiving. So insurance companies are usually holding stuff up because of information. They normally don't have the information for that person to just put the stamp on it. And in the files that I've reviewed for legal or, or some kind of dispute, 90% of them are not enough information, very poorly written estimates, uh, very poor paperwork from the field, which then leads to uncertainty of why are you asking for a $25,000 check or a $50,000 check or put it into the equivalent, like why are you asking for a truck or a car and you've given me the paperwork that you know I barely would, would pay for a hot water tank on it. It's just your, your degree of communication. And the other thing is sometimes we don't let the adjusters adjust. So if you're not communicating early and often with them at the beginning of the claim, they, at the end, have to justify whatever they said they thought it was going to be. I thought the job would be 10 grand and you come in at 25. There's a whole bunch of review that needs to happen. So it's usually communication. Uh, that would be my biggest focus is communicate, even if it's rough, like they're pretty cynical just for the job they do. Just communicate a ton at the beginning and then follow it through set expectations. Hey, we're going to send you the invoice. Can you get us a check in 30 days? We're, we don't run our businesses like, sorry, as a general rule, we don't normally run our businesses like a plumber or HVAC company. We run at sort of almost like a servant to them and, and whatever they do, that's fine. No, it should be clear and concise uh, communication. 
are you even doing work with the insurance company? That's the other thing. Should you be getting the payment from the homeowner? Is it a whole, your contracts with the homeowner? So if you're not on a preferred program, then you're probably working with the homeowner, put pressure on the insurance company. And that's, that you can unpack that in, in about four days, but that would be the quick answer. Um, when listing items for schedule of loss, how detailed should people be? So schedule of loss. So there's two, yeah. So if we're talking listing contents for the schedule of loss, the schedule of loss is so that the insured can take that or your customer can take that to the adjuster and say, these are the things that are getting disposed of. Uh, these are the items that we're going to be um, asking for replacement pricing on. More detail on those items for sure, because if you're not holding the items until the homeowner gets a check, your customer is depending on you documenting that really well. So document serial numbers. If you have a computer, a serial number, if you're dealing with um, sort of the higher the price, the more documentation you should do because you're helping your customer get compensated for the stuff they're losing. Now you're getting paid generally as a, as a, as a service, you're getting paid to list that item. So take more time in the pack out and actually, actually list those non-restorable items. If you're in those questionable item lists, you have to still do it as if you're throwing the stuff out. And then if you're moving things into cleaning, normally we just do a picture for like the cleaning and this is our, our, our cleaning schedule. So take a picture, document pre-existing conditions and then send it through the clean process. But if it fails, then you've got to document that item like it's a non-restorable because that's effectively what you've now classed as either economically non-restorable or you and your team don't have the skills to do it or there's just no process for it. Then you got to just go detail. So it would be a picture of the item uh, many pictures, if it's like high value TV, just serial number, picture of the TV for sort of like four to eight angles, if depending on value. And then, uh, and then you want to put some notes in there. Like it's a Sony TV. Usually the pictures will tell it anything, but anything that's missing, uh, from a description I'd put in there. And that's, that's helping the homeowner, um, with, with getting rid of their stuff. So. Here's a question that came in. How come companies are paid less for contents technicians than fire or water technicians? Okay. Um, so there, there's a couple, there's a couple things that come into that play there. As a rule, when you do time and material and you're doing it in a commercial environment, so if you're negotiating rate material, typically a technician is a technician is a technician. You have a contents technician, water technician, and then maybe let's say we have a fire technician. All the technician rates are the same. When you get into unit pricing and the systems that were there, 20 years ago, we didn't have the training. And, and I don't know if this is, guys, and, and put in the chat if you agree or disagree with this, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this is a, a major opinion, but this is where I think things came apart, is 20 or 30 years ago when, when the pricing systems were being built. Exactimate or stability were getting uh, built out. There wasn't a lot of skill set for the cleaning technicians in what we did. We didn't have a lot of courses for them. If you were to look now, what does a contents technician need to do? Well, they need to clean fabrics. Uh, they need to clean hard items. They need to deal with odors and porous items. Uh, they have to understand how water impacts items. They have to understand how fire impacts items. So if we looked at the training for a flood tech and then a contents technician, there arguably there's more skill set needed for a contents technician to restore a computer or to restore a table than there is for a flood technician to save drywall and put equipment in. So I'm the argument that there's less skill or there's less training for contents doesn't hold up today, but it did maybe 20 years ago. Uh, when I got in the industry, there was a lot more focus on water. And so it was a higher priority but today I, I think a technician is a technician is a technician I don't think there should be a value difference I don't know what you guys think but uh, put it in the chat if you want I I just think a technician is a technician they're all the training is is equivalent um, it's actually harder in some cases to be contents because contents is really hard to do right that's why not a lot of people do it so it's it is a more niche skill and it's a harder skill in my opinion uh, 
if we don't save drywall, no one cares if you cut it out. If you don't save the teddy bear, uh, everyone cares about the teddy bear, right? So it's it's one of those things like, can you do it? Uh, and then can you do it safely? That's a different level of responsibility. Good question. Yeah, for sure. Put it in the chat. Let us know what your uh, thoughts are. Um, so next question, what tips do you have for explaining to a client the replacement cost value versus the actual cash value? Seems a lot so, of homeowners don't know the difference. So it can be Yeah, difficult. so be careful because you don't know the insurance policy. So when you, you move into or you're explaining an insurance policy and you don't know necessarily how their policy is written. So there's some there's a whole bunch of clauses, like every contract's different. And it's, you know, what's replacement cost? If you replace the item, you'll get paid for the replacement. But there's contracts out there that are like, hey, you'll get 80% of the replacement. There's a co-insurance value on it, usually in commercial or farm agriculture. Um, but just be careful. Just be like, hey, actual cash value is like the depreciated garage sale amount. Uh, it's what it's worth today, but in the used state. Replacement cost is what it would be what it costs to replace at full price, no sales. And that's kind of the, the easy way to explain the difference and be like, well, when we document your item, you can either get actual cash value. So if you're not going to replace it, they'll just give you the, the value of it today. If you replace it, they'll just pay for the replacement. That's what it is from our team's opinion. But I wouldn't be talking to the customer too much about it. Be like, hey, you should talk to your adjuster about that. Uh, because you don't want to be crossing that line of saying something and it not to be true, especially on the insurance policy. Cause that's a contract between the customer and the insurance company. And there's a lot of like, it's all legal ease. Some of it might apply. Some of it might not apply. Some of their contents, like if it's a, let's say jewelry, they have replacement costs, but not for more than $2,000. So you get into a whole bunch of these what ifs, it's $2,000. That's all they have for coverage. Well, you might spend that $2,000 on cleaning uh, jewelry than replacing it or only replacing the stuff that's really valuable to you and letting the other stuff go or whatever happens. That's not for us to have those conversations. So I'd, I'd explain it very lightly and then tell them to talk to their adjuster. Yeah, that's great advice. So just going along with some contents, um, what would you say are some major uh, pack out pitfalls? Disorganization and training. So I, well, probably if you start, it's actually prioritizing contents above everything else. We're bad. And I say we as myself and my teams were bad because we had a lot of people focus on structure. Maybe when you get a little older and you get a little bit more gray hairs, you realize no one cares about drywall. Like my wife could care less if we put a hole in the wall. She cares if we put a dent in the table. So you start looking at what is more valuable in contents. Contents is a higher priority. We lose drywall because it takes time to get people's stuff out. People care about their stuff. They don't care about the materials in a building generally. So from a contents perspective, it's prioritizing contents. Like what can we save? Let's get that stuff out immediately. Do you save everything? No, go talk to the customer and say, what's important to save in this room? That's the first thing we're going to try saving. And then we're going to save the next wave of stuff, which is stuff we think we can save. And then we're going to deal with the non-restorables and get them out. And if they're wet and sitting in sewer, they're, they're wet and sewer soaked, leave them. Like we'll, we'll get to them unless it's a health and safety concern, but we're going to go save the stuff we can save. So it's prioritizing and building that, that response culture where what, when we get to a house, we're going to go save stuff. And when we get there, we're going to really focus on the stuff that's important. And that's, if you do that, you win more times. Like people will, will defend you. Oh my God, you saved the, like a stuffed animal from a, a three-year-old. You took my three-year-old's unicorn away from her. Uh, she got sick on it like a, a week ago, but it's got a battery in it. So you need like an ultrasonics clean to get this thing really nicely clean. I couldn't clean it with water. I had to go replace it for her when she was sleeping. That was devastating. If someone, a restorer would come in and say, hey, I can, I can replace that or I can, I can clean it for you oh my God, you're just a hero because that creates a lot of drama in our house. Those are the types of wins that I would focus on in contents, but it's it's on your pack out, it's organization. Put two people in a room, don't overload your boxes, make sure you're making money on your labor and time, um, make sure your teams know how to pack out, make sure they know how to stack, like get a process really drilled down there and then and then have the team you know, really rigid on 
not every job is different. Every job has some unique challenges, but you can have a standardized way of approaching it and then crush it and have those supervisors like be really proud that they can really get those jobs done in an effective and uh, meaningful way where the customer sees you working, they feel you care about their stuff. I think that's how you win jobs every day of the week. And no one cares about drywall and baseboard. Like we do as restorers, we're like, we could dry it. No one cares. Save the content. So that's where the money is at uh, from, from a perspective of winning hearts and minds with the customer, save the contents and be organized and, and, and tell the customer what you're planning on doing. Don't just do it. Get them involved, get them to be part of the process, move them in. But to do that, you have to have a skill level where you have confidence. So if you have a high confidence, you can then do that where you engage somebody. If they ask you questions, you can answer it. When you're low skilled, it's hard to do that because you don't want a question that you can't answer. If that makes sense. So just moving away from contents um, and into some water damage questions, what is the proper method to setting up drying chambers in a large loss, so say 200 chambers and 700 rooms? Ooh, beautiful. So great question. So if you had 700 rooms and 200 chambers, I'd be asking why. Now, now the goal is to keep as least the least amount of chambers as possible. Uh, because every time you add a chamber, you add administrative tasks to your team. You have to report differently per chamber. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot more psychrometric, so you're going to be walking around with your meter more. On large commercial, the, the goal is to reduce the chambers to drying like kind of conditions. I'm, I'm going to use that term, sort of like like kind of conditions. So if we have a an environment here, this office, let's say this office was a server room, and we have all these computers in here. We're going to dry that in a cooler environment so we don't damage hardware. That's a chamber. But then I've got 25 offices stacked up in, in the normal business. I'm going to dry all those the same because they're all going to be in the same condition. But then we get to the kitchen and the kitchen's got a cabinet that is really sensitive to heat, maybe like a thermal foil. I'm going to then dry that a little bit differently. I might put like an injected dry system in uh, to dry the, the cabinet and behind the cabinet. I might make that a chamber in itself. So I'm gonna have three chambers and I'm gonna try keeping it down to the least amount of chambers possible on a commercial event. If you get into like big losses, hotels, drying the entire floor as a floor because the the air is gonna balance itself out. So the, the energy properties of the air, the thermal dynamics of the air are gonna balance itself out. So I wouldn't get into trying to build a lot of chambers. I'd be worried about airflow and and having the right dehumidification, but the least amount of chambers as possible is the goal. Yeah, good question. If you can't, then it's, then you're, this is a great thing actually to answer your question. If you have a job where you got like lots of chambers, let's say it's, it's, it's 200 apartments and they've got property in there and you've got to keep the doors closed. You've got to talk with the adjuster and just say, hey, this is a lot of paperwork for us to document this because we've got 200 individual chambers that we need to run we're going to have more people running each chamber because we got to control the atmosphere of each chamber and we got to monitor it and then we have to document it that's just what we do and so that's going to be more money on the documentation phase as opposed to uh, if we had a commercial environment where we could control the entire floor and open all the doors and dry it as one big chamber Hope that answers your question. So if you have a tile floor in a newer building and you can't confirm if the, the subfloor is wood or concrete, is your recommendation to remove the tile if it's not drying down or making improvements after days of it being tented um, to a dehumidifier? Yeah, so you got a couple options. You, you should be able to find out from, now, if you're talking to like, a condo or, or a building, they should have a building manager that shouldn't be able to tell. Um, there's some times when you can do things like if, if the tiled around the kitchen island, you can lift the island and see what's underneath it. So you could do some stuff to see if you can save money. And this is a discussion with an adjuster. Just be like, hey, we think that this might be concrete or, or wood underneath. Uh, we want to, we're, we're going to do a little bit of an investigation. Otherwise we'll tear up the tile, but we're trying to save the tile we're going to spend some money doing this. Are you in agreement with it? 
yeah, okay, cool. I send you an email. Hey, as per our conversation, you're in agreement here. Um, but most buildings, you should be able to find the flooring type pretty easily. Another way that you might come in is you do a just a cost analysis. If you were to drive from below, so let's say it's wood uh, and it's a couple layers of plywood. If you're trying to go and drive through tile, you have a very low perm factor on tile. On the wood side, it's a higher perm factor. So the moisture will want to go out the other end. Can you get below it and build an environment to drive from below and pull the moisture through the wood instead of trying to pull it through the, the tile? If you're on wood and it's category two or three, it's coming out. Like you're not going to be able to keep it in there. So it's, it's coming out. If it's concrete, that's a decision. So it definitely depends on what you're trying to do or what your water is. But I would, if I'm dealing with wood and I'm dealing with a category one, I'm going to try drying it usually from the bottom anyway. Um, Cause tenting it, you're, you got to put a lot of drying force in that tent to pull the moisture through the, uh, the grout and through the tile. You could look, um, so, so one other thing like vents, if you find any ducting or vents or any chases that are coming through, um, you can even punch a hole into like, if, if it's all high-end ceramic tile or, or porcelain, you could punch a hole in the wall and then try getting into the, into a void to look like in a closet, just punch a hole and look into the wall and see what's below the, uh, uh, the wood. You can go in that way and do some exploratory surgery on the building that's low cost to repair if if you're dealing with that kind of number where it makes sense so how do we quickly identify the immediate actions to take to ensure the machines used to mitigate and get the water damage to a minimum in an emergency situation do you could you reread that one yeah. So how do we quickly identify the immediate actions to take to ensure the machines applications used to mitigate and get the water damage to a minimum in, a, in an emergency situation? Okay. So, so it's kind of like hitting, hitting a job where every job, if you walk in again, as your training comes up and as your, your field time comes up, this might make a lot more sense, but I, you look at it as a water damage job, is effectively the same job, doesn't matter what you're doing. You go to the job, you determine is a category one, two, three. Then you, if, if you say any water that's there, we need to remove it physically. So we're gonna extract it. If we're trying to dry water, we're gonna spend a lot of time drying water off of a surface or inside a material. Can we pull it out with a machine? Cause that's faster and more efficient. Yes, we can pull it out with a machine. So we identify the category, we then remove the water, Let's say we're dealing with a category one just for, for time's sake. We remove the water, as much water as we can with our mechanical devices. So a wand removes about 17% of the water. One of those ride-on hydro X's, I think I heard Craig Kirschmeyer's making them. Uh, if you're riding on a hydro X, they're like, they literally look like a little cart you stand on. A dry ease has a rover. Anywhere between like 80 and 85% of the water is out of the, the carpet. So big difference between 17% and 85%. So if you remove 85% of the water, you're drying 15% that's left. So I'm looking at extraction and then what equipment am I putting in? Well, I'm going to size it using the IICRC starting point calculations, right? So I'm going to size the amount of air movement I need because I want to try getting the velocity across the materials to transfer energy to those materials. We're going to put in the dehumidifiers that we, we need. So I, I use, and you'll see in Circle Hydro when we built that, we use the detailed uh, dehumidification calculation. The reason why is it gets you closer to your starting point. It's not perfect, but it, I like it because it gets you closer to your starting point. And then after that, if you look in circle hydro, but if you're not hydro, you set your conditions. We call it tolerances of the drying job. So we say, well, we want it between 70 and 90 degrees or 80 and 90. So you, you set the tolerance. That's where you're going to dry between 80 and 90. If I dry too hot, Maybe I have a risk of damaging stuff. Too cold is just not enough uh, uh, energy. So I want between 80 and 90. So you set that tolerance. What's your relative humidity? Well, I don't want to exceed 50 and I don't want to go less than 30. Okay, well, that's your next tolerance. And then you say, well, but also I got materials that I can't get those materials to dew point. And, and so those materials can't be too cold or we'll get condensation. So we set a dew point differential and in hydro, that's why those three parameters are there. Because if you do that, then now you have a drying plan and your drying plan is effectively 
we're going to dry the environment between 80 and 90. We're going to keep the relative humidity between 30 and 50. And we're never going to have a dew point differential of less than 10 or 15 degrees. If we go in between any of those uh, parameters, then we're not following our drying plan. So once you do that, all the equipment you're installing, if, you're de if, you're, if your humidity goes up, I'm going to put another dehumidifier in. Why? Because I said that we don't want to be over 50% relative humidity and the, the air movers are putting too much humidity in the air. So I need another dehumidifier to pull it out. And so your drying plan is effectively, how do you set up your equipment? You come up with a plan of what are you gonna to do to that job to create the vapor pressure and the energy transfer to the materials that you want. And then it's super exciting because now you're just reporting every day. Hey, we kept, we, we said we wanted to dry here and we are. And we said we were gonna do this. And so all those calculations don't matter now. All the IICRC calculations are, are effectively not even uh, a consideration the second you turned your equipment on. So that's how I would approach the job. And that's how I would size the job. That'll get you really close on equipment. And then like the other thing is, is if you're dealing with, let's say you have a, a an old wall, maybe it's plaster or it's just like a 1960s house with, with old drywall that's been painted a hundred times. Then you're like, okay, well, can I dry water through nine layers of paint? No, maybe not. So I'll put an inject to dry unit in and, and dry from the backside. That's that's where you start looking at your equipment and how can you apply it to the job. I don't know. Sorry, I got a little ramped up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just had a question come in. Do you agree with top-down drying on carpet after carpet pad has been removed? I do. I do. And here's the reason why. So the old way used to be that we would float carpet. So we would actually put the air mover underneath and it would lift the carpet and you'd be drying it. And the theory was that you'd be you'd be separating it. Now there's some, some thought to that, which is you pull the carpet off and you put a layer of air there and you're drying the subfloor and the carpet because longer, let's say the, the subfloor is wood, the longer it's in contact with water, the harder it is to dry. And so what's easier to dry carpet or, or the wood? Well, carpet's easier to dry. So the wood we're going to make harder to dry. It's going to take longer, but you damage the carpet if you do that. So then it becomes, well, is a carpet worth saving? I like even if you had pad and you had the right vapor pressure set up, you could dry carpet and pad, but you, you, you kind of run into that risk that the pad is going to have that nasty odor. So, and it's cheap. So pull it out. It's easy to replace. It's easy to repair the carpet, take the pad out on like every job. That, that's how we did it. Um, I had a really good ops manager who was like, no, we're not saving pad because it's like literally a waste of time. And it was, it's easy to put back. So, uh, I'm, but carpet top down drying. Yeah. You, you, I don't see the downside of it because the carpet's going to dry in 24 hours with the type of pressure we put into it. So we're not going to saturate that wood for very long. Like the carpet's wet, you extract it. So let's say we, we do a really good extraction. The carpet's damp at best in contact with wood. The wood already got wet. We dry that carpet in 24 hours. It normally doesn't take much longer in 24 hours if you have the right setup. What are we doing then? We're, we're drying the wood. The wood doesn't really need velocity across the surface. It needs vapor pressure. So the top-down method works. It There's not a lot of times I would say I wouldn't. It's If you get into commercial rubber back carpet or you get into like some wool carpets, then maybe you would consider rolling it back uh, if you couldn't damage the carpet. But I like top-down. I I I can honestly say I don't think I've had if I see a top-down nylon or a normal residential carpet have at her like I you'll you'll dry that out in 12 day 24 hours and then you're drying the structure so yeah what's your what's your thoughts there Carson like are you disagreeing with that or or are you you question whether you can because because it makes a difference right some people are are worrying like hey I don't have enough airflow over it okay but it's porous right like nylon doesn't hold water in the fiber it's it's on the surface, so it should dry quick. It's maybe in the backing a little bit, but it really, it carpet's unique. Carpet doesn't hold a lot of water. It just, it just, sorry, it doesn't absorb a lot of water. It may hold a lot of water, right? Yeah, yeah, it, I, I'm looking at the extraction gets you damp and then the vapor pressure and the airflow gets you dry pretty quick. Like I'd be surprised drywall and, and carpet drywall will dry, let's say in two to three days, 
uh, carpet will dry in like one, maybe one and a half, like probably between your visits, it's drying. Like you come on your, your second day, zero to one, it's probably dry or pretty close. And then, and then on the next day, somewhere in between you come back and everything's dry. If you got enough airflow and enough vapor pressure. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why there's a lot of controversy to that, to be honest. Do you have any suggestions on advanced moisture detection techniques for hidden moisture? I like FLIR. Like I like the infrared cameras um, for looking for evaporative cooling. So I use this in New Hampshire. We were, we were doing the ice dams and hidden moisture was like, Hey, before we come in and do anything, let's use the infrared uh, camera to look around at the room and see if there was any cooling. And sure enough, like right in the middle of the room where no one would have looked and there was no staining happening, there was a cold spot. So we put our meter on there and it was wet. Well, what had happened is, I guess the way the roof was and the dormer was, it was like set back in into the roof. So it was coming in, not on the edges, but like in the middle. And it and so you're using thermal imaging, imaging to try to find that, that uh, uh, evaporative cooling. I like that. Um, what we, I don't see a lot of use of is like the hammer probe to, to check materials or ch check materials under materials uh, or to check into sill plates. Like so many people are leaving their subfloors wet because they're not putting a pin. They're putting like pins into the carpet going, oh, the carpet's dry. Did you hammer probe into the, uh, into the subfloor? Uh, other advanced techniques, uh, the looking at concrete. My brother-in-law is a high-end uh, hardwood flooring installer. Uh, he does some of the biggest and, and wealthiest homes in Vancouver. And his projects, they're always checking the concrete to make sure with, it's within the right range to install materials. In a water loss, if you're not checking the concrete, the next trade is waiting for that, that material to get to the installation parameters. So we have two pro, pro, um, concerns. We have the dry standard. What was the normal concrete levels in a building? You need a special concrete meter to find that. And then it's, hey, what's the conditions for the rebuild materials going in? If you ask early in the job, how fast are we repairing this home? And they're like, as quick as possible, then your job is to get that concrete to a dry standard. And most people don't have a concrete meter in their kit. And it's a special meter. If you're not familiar with it, it's a, Tramex makes one. I got one in the back there. If you guys wanna see it after when we're done, I'll, uh, I'll pull it out for anyone that wants to stay, but it's, it's a different meter. You need to have a specialty meter. So advanced looking for moisture would be that, would be an infrared camera. Um, the right, having all like, not just a single meter with two quarter inch pins on it, but having the hammer probe, uh, some other pins in it and really going hard on your investigation at the beginning to find out where is that water. Okay, I'll bring I'll bring that out when we uh, when we get it. Yeah, it looks like there's definitely some interest to see that. Okay, I'll I'll pull up the Tramex kit. I got Tramex and Delmhurst sitting in the closet, so I'll pull those out at the end. Perfect. Um, and so, are there any tips for doing remediation work for a medical facility? A hundred percent. You need to get properly trained. So, ICRA uh, infection control. Ah, uh, what is it? ICRA. It's the infection control training. I forget the RA, um, but you're going to get the, you're going to have to have that because you're, and then you're going to be working with a, a facilities engineer. So when you're doing medical, you're effectively running different types of drying processes. You might have rooms that are set up under negative pressure for a reason. Uh, you may have rooms that are set up on positive pressure. If you go in and dry it like a residential environment, you're going to change those pressures. You're now changing the way the building's airflow was designed to control bacteria or viruses or, you know, clean rooms uh, if you have surgical areas. So it depends on the level of, of medical you're doing. Like a dentist office might be a little different, but you still have tools that have to be covered up. So your, your attention to detail goes way up. Your liability goes up. Uh, the nice thing is, is you, your rates normally go up to go with it. So it's a specialized art uh, of learning medical because you have extra regulations, but you're also doing a lot more communication with an engineer. Hey, can we do this? Hey, can we, uh, can we dry this way? 
if we are drawing this way, do we need to do anything different? Hey, where can we plug into uh, certain certain outlets are, are color coded differently? Can you plug your air mover or dehumidifier into a red uh, plug? Probably not. It, like, where are you putting your equipment? So you would just work with the facilities manager and and go through the facility with them and say, OK, here's here's our setup. What do we need to do? Uh, can you have doors open? Sometimes you can't even have some doors open because you change the airflow of that area. So um, medical is, is tricky. Uh, if you do it well, you're, you're in that, it's, it's kind of like leaving, leaving the restoration field and saying, Hey, I specialize in medical or I specialize in, in healthcare. Um, do you have extra concerns? Well, you're going to be dealing with sick people. So now you're dealing with high risk occupants. So you and your team have to be on your, your A game to do it. And so training, um, you know, bringing in consultants when you're doing a job, when you're new, you're not doing it by yourself. If you are, you're crazy. Bring in a consultant that can work with you and, and get your processes, uh, your protocols all set up. And as long as your processes are following the right standards and you have the right checkpoints, you'll be fine. Don't, don't overcommit yourself. That would be my biggest thing is just, if you're not doing that type of work daily, don't walk into it thinking that it's just a house. Here's a bit of a more uh, technical question. So it's when using screws to check a deeper moisture content of structural lumber in combination with a moisture meter, so still plate, sorry, sill plates, studs, et cetera. I've heard that the screws are supposed to go parallel with the grain of the lumber. Have you ever heard this? Also, does the type of screws matter, whether they're brass, stainless, et cetera? Oh, good question. You know what? Hold on. Hold on one second. I got something. We'll throw something up. If you were to, uh, if you were to look at like a sill plate, here, let's turn this so you guys can like. If we're looking at a sill plate, and you got a wood subfloor, can you use screws instead of your pins instead of jamming a hammer probe? So, I'm gonna put it in here. It doesn't matter if you go with the grain against the grain, and I'm not balanced. So, give me a second here. So, we put it in. What we're doing is we're looking at how much, how much is this screw picking up any point in this wood where it's wet? So, oh, I'm behind my name here. So if we drive it down deeper, if we're coming in, it doesn't matter how deep you go or which way you go. You're effectively coming into this where you're saying, hey, between this one inch into the wood and the edge, whatever your moisture meter is picking up, it's picking up the highest reading in there. So if it's picking up the highest reading, it doesn't matter if it's on the edge or in the core, you're drying the wood to its dry standard. And that water in the center of the wood has to come out. So you can make a decision, like as you put different screws in, you can be like, hey, it's kind of dry here at like a quarter inch. We're really wet in the core. We've got to keep drying that wood. And how dry is dry? Well, you have a dry standard and you're going to make a decision. If the outside's really dry and the core is a little bit wet, then you're going to be like, okay, well, I think based on my expertise, I think that's good enough for drying, but using screws is good. And then the other question is, how do you use, uh, which material you use? So we were always told stainless steel is the way to do it. I talked to Tom over at Delmhurst. He's the president of the company. And he's like, hey, I'm doing some research that stainless might not be the right thing. It might throw your meters off. Now, meters are off anyway. So we used to run stereo wire. When we would do crawl spaces, we'd go in and we'd put stainless steel screws all over the, the floor. And then what we built is we built like a board and we had banana clips in there. We would just run our wires, label them and just build a board. And then we put our probe into the banana clips. And all we did is we did some tests. We were like, well, what's the resistance of going through all that stereo wire to the crawl space? And you'd go take your meter, put it on the stainless steel screws, Let's say it was it was 20. You come back to the board and it's 19. You just put a minus one saying that we have a minus one differentiator between the spot and here because of all the wire. It really wasn't that that far off. Like it maybe one percentage point is what we would see, maybe two on a really long run. But you do 3,000, 4,000 feet and you'd never go under. You just just go up and down the board and record your readings. 
And then every other day we'd go do an inspection of the crawl space, make sure everything was connected and, and to test the other areas, but it was hot down there. It was hard. So yeah, that's, that's why I would, if you were using screws, you're looking for the wettest spot between those two points. So there's two screws, not just one. There'll be two screws in there, like your moisture points. And you just put the pins up against the, uh, the screws and they'll give you your reading. And then what I would do is I would just test it against like against the wood with just the probe itself and see if there's a difference there. Normally there's not too big of a difference. Good That's question. Good. Yeah, who doesn't love some props in a webinar, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are your thoughts on stabilization for extended periods of time while waiting on approvals from adjusters uh, for demo? So non-program work jobs they specified. Yeah. Hey, listen, insurance company has a right to investigate. So there's, there's a conflict here. The, you want to restore the job, but you're not obligated to restore the job. The insured has to take action and, and they're expected to mitigate the loss, but the insurance company also has a right to investigate. So it's kind of one of these gray water areas where if you had to take something to court, everyone would argue it, not you. It'd be like, well, did they take the right action? And then did the insurance company waive their right to investigate and accept the claim as is? So at the beginning, if you get to a job and, and uh, I used to I ha have a video on, on an old platform. If you ever look up roving restore, it was some videos that I'll redo now that we've, uh, we've got time and, and a new plan here. Uh, but I had seven reasons to stabilize a job. And the intention of those videos was like, kick it off to an adjuster to be like, I'm not responsible to dry your building when you don't know, when I don't know who's paying um, or you have to do your investigation. So it's no different than if you were to look at like a fire and we board up a house and they have to investigate for three weeks. Okay. And meanwhile, things are corroding. It's no different. Water is no different. If you need to investigate because you're not sure if that's a covered loss and you're, you want to do it, then you can investigate. We'll stabilize, control the humidity so that other materials don't get uh, impacted by the water. That's what you're doing. You're not going to stop mold growth on the materials that are wet, but you're going to stop mold growth or microbial growth from an unaffected part of the building. And that's the goal of stabilization is controlling the humidity. And you can do that before and after uh, a loss. So you could have it like after the hurricanes, if you walked away from an environment that wasn't, that was, you, 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 you restored it, but the, there's no air conditioning or climate control put back in there. It's going to mold up. The drywall is going to be super humid. So you're going to have to put in climate controls to, to, uh, prevent mold growth. That's a stabilization after the loss has been done. So they're, they're valid. Is it worth it? That's for somebody to decide, but you provide a service. The homeowner wants to stabilize it for the investigation to take place. That's a good service to provide and it's legit and it's supported all in the standards. Uh, my thought on it is, is yeah, if the insurance carrier hasn't communicated back that you're good to go ahead or the homeowner is good to, to get started on the work because they need an adjuster on site, then you need just to communicate, hey, we're going to be stabilizing. Now, what a lot of contractors don't do is they don't give the uh, uh, the ROM, the rough order magnitude or the burn rate per day. I'd just be like, hey, listen, we're going to stabilize this house and $650 a day for us to do it. And the homeowner can let them know. You put a couple of emails across and you just say, we're stabilizing at $650. Hey, we're stabilizing. Uh, it's been four days. It's $2,400. And, uh, and, and would you like us to get going or would you like to keep stabilizing? And just just run the tally card, let them know what it's costing and be like, Hey, we're now at a point where it's, it's cheaper to, to do the restoration. Hey, we moved from category one. We're now category two, three. So now we're taking these materials out when we do get the approval, all of that should be communicated and, and help the adjuster make a good decision for their company. So we've got about eight minutes left. Um, I'll try and get a few more questions in here. So how do you think the current understanding of the serious impacts of mold on human health will affect the restoration industry? We've always known, like I'm, I'll, 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 so I, how does it affect? Nobody wears respirators still on site. You don't do site safety assessments. As a, gen, as a I say you, as an industry, you don't see site safety assessments. No one's quoting OSHA. 
Uh, rarely is anyone going in full PPE onto a jobs, myself included. And I picked up asthma guys. Like I was really good lung capacity, um, high performance lung capacity back 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I was in one of the worst mold jobs. It was like a, the only thing I could describe it is like KY jelly on the walls. And it was a mold that was like slimy, but like a jelly. And that job, after that job, I between that and going to Fort McMurray, which was Canada's largest wildfire, between those two jobs in six months, I went from good lung capacity to asthma, 91% lung capacity. So it's a high risk. I don't think it changes anything. It's just we go in, do you document your jobs properly? Because you don't want to be told that you left the job moldy. The only way you do that is a really good inspection at the front and a really good inspection at the end. You can be a little loose in the middle. But you need to leave that job saying that wherever you sampled and tested is dry and wherever you sampled and tested at the beginning was wet. And then, hey, this is dry. And we sampled a whole bunch of other areas that are still dry. When we left the job, those materials were dry. There's no mold that could have grown between here and there. So that, that would be key. Well, the impact is, I think you've already seen the impact of mold because there was that whole mold uh, push in the late 90s and early 2000s. All of that's already hit the market. It's just we're just, it's just our business. So if people are worried about mold, then then they should be in water damage. We absolutely don't do deep enough inspections as a general rule into what needs to be dried and how much does it need to get dried to. Just quickly, actually, someone had asked, "What does the I C uh, sorry I C R A stand for?" The I, so it's IICRC, it's the Institute of Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration, uh, and Inspection. Um, so you've got the IICRC. So I hope I got that one right off the top of my yeah, head. Yeah, they requested uh, ICRA, I think it's Infection Control Risk. Oh, ICRA, assessment. ICRA, sorry. Yeah. I, I, um, ICRA, um, yeah, it's the Infection Control, and I forget the last two acronyms off the top of my head. You put uh, ICRA medical, um, put a a ICRA and healthcare, and you'll get you'll get the course up there. Awesome. Um, maybe moving on to some fire and smoke. So, what's the tep, uh, the best type of cleaning materials or solution um, for restoring fire damaged items like wood or fabric or papers? So, so, so interesting. You, you, good question but there, it depends. Um, wood, it depends on its finish. If it's got a, a polymer finish, then, then you treat it like plastic. If it's got a, uh, an oil-based finish, then you would use like a wood cleaner for it. So there's that, and that's what makes contents interesting or like contents, there's, you can't clean with just one solution. You can't just have a degreaser in the truck and be like, oh, we're contents cleaning. Uh, no, degreaser will, will absolutely strip wood don't use your degreasers on a natural wood. Like that is not what you're gonna do. Um, you're gonna use some other types of cleaners specifically for the wood, depending on how it's been, been treated. Uh, is it a, a natural wood, like unfinished wood? Well, are you gonna just sand it, give it a light sand? How much materials got into those pores? Do you need to seal it after? There's a whole bunch of things that you would uh, go through when you're dealing with that. Now, paper is interesting. Paper, cardboard, those are porous materials. What are you cleaning? So if it's low value, like a normal book, an encyclopedia, let's go $300 or less, uh, replace it. You're not gonna clean paper. You're not gonna remove uh, particulate from paper. If it's a historical document, maybe you're gonna use lasers on it, right? Maybe you can laser clean and, and, and burn the carbon off of it. Maybe you're gonna do some kind of dry cleaning where you're 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 using a duster or electrostatic to try to lift that material off but paper there's so many jobs where we see where it's like a protein fire or another fire and they leave all the books on the shelf and are like oh we cleaned them how did you clean them what was your process because i i would throw them out so how are you cleaning them and so you have to start looking at those individuals a really good course um a really, if you guys want to know a good contents course and a really good instructor is uh, James Toll, and it's the contents uh, contents processing technician CPT. 
Um, and that was a really good course. And he goes into the detail. If you are more advanced on contents, then the CLS uh, through the RA is a really good one. Because you start getting into all of these discussions of how do you clean rugs and, and everything else. Yeah, there's no one one size fits all for contents. It's it's definitely solution based, and you got to know your chemical. I think this. Oh yeah, so so I haven't fired this up yet, but I'm looking forward to putting these in. Uh, Tremex sent me the uh, the remote monitoring system, so I got the cloud station and uh, and they just recently sent that out to me. So I'm gonna get that cracked open and play around with that. But I was at an event and I won this, but I was like, literally the only thing I wanted to win was this, uh, was this inspection kit. All right. So this is the, uh, this is the Tremex encounter. Uh, here, let's get it. So it zooms in, get the face out of the way. There we go. So in there, that's the concrete meter. Now what makes it different is on the back, you've got these, uh, these little pins. And these pins are on a spring. So what you do is you put these on and you test the concrete and it'll give you a reading. And then you turn it and you test the same spot and it'll give you a reading. And what you're doing is you're not looking on a scale of like one to a hundred, you're looking at a scale of zero to six. And so you go to your, your unaffected concrete and you do a couple tests and then you come over to your affected concrete and you do a couple tests and what you're looking for is to try to get it in that like three three and a half if your dry standards three three and a half that's where you're going to be but your concrete is not going to go to a hundred it's going to be somewhere in that like maybe five five and a half and that's too wet and so you're coming in with your concrete meter doing your investigation this is a great tool for doing that type of investigation they have another meter that has a probe under it. And so you can do the, the uh, ASTM standards where you, you drill into the concrete and then you're testing uh, the concrete there. Now I haven't, I haven't got into that meter how it works, but I just know that it's got a probe underneath and then it runs the electrical current through the concrete so it can give them a reading. All these tools are just helping you do your investigation and say, here's what we're looking for. And in that inspection, we're trying to find what the normal concrete levels are, and then we're going to apply our, our techniques to, to get that dry. Well, now you have a meter that's specifically calibrated and designed for concrete. That would, that's like key on how many jobs do you have concrete that you're running into that we're not metering. You have to meter it. You have to document what's going on there. Anything, uh, yeah. sorry, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'm sure everyone loved seeing the new uh, meter. Thank awesome. you so much, Chris, for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge. Um, thank you all again so, so much. Awesome. Have a great day, guys.